Pope Francis fills his 2016 travel calendar. The bishop shows us what shepherding means in the midst of tragedy, and some unlikely visitors stop at the Vatican. Hello and welcome to this edition of Vatican Connections. Let's take a look at what's been happening. Pope Francis will visit Lund, Sweden in October. Now the Vatican made the announcement this week. The Pope is going to Sweden to take part in a ceremony marking the 500th anniversary of the Reformation and it's being hosted by the Church of Sweden in collaboration with the Catholic Church in Sweden and the Christian Council of Sweden. Now, why is this commemoration happening in Lund? This is where the Worldwide Lutheran Federation was born back in 1947, and it's been the Lutheran capital for Scandinavia. The Lutheran primate of Sweden, Bishop Anche Jacqueline, said she is very happy that the Pope will visit Lund and said we share a mission to proclaim the gospel. The Catholic Bishop of Stockholm, Anders Arborelius, said Lund was once the Catholic center for the North, and it's now home to a very unique ecumenical situation. Sweden really is a periphery of the Catholic Church. There are just over 100,000 Catholics in Sweden, and a lot of those are immigrants, and there's only 44 parishes in the whole country. Now switching gears, the Pope's exhortation on the family, the final product of the two synods on the family, will be released in March. Archbishop Vincenzo Paglia of the Pontifical Council for the Family told a group of priests to whom he was giving a talk in the Algarve, he said he expects the documents to underline once more Pope Francis's call that the church be a church that goes out to meet the people. He added, I am convinced the exhortation will be a hymn of love, a love that desires to take care of its children, that knows how to be close to wounded families and give them strength, that wants to be close to its children and all of humanity in need. On a different note, six Canadian dioceses will no longer be considered mission territories. The dioceses of Kiwatin La Paz, Church Hill Hudson Bay, Moosonee, Gruard McLennan, Mackenzie Fort Smith, and Whitehorse are now fully under the jurisdiction of the Congregation for Bishops. Until now, these dioceses were under the jurisdiction of and received financial support from the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples. So this was not an unexpected move. The Canadian bishops and the Holy See have actually been working on this transition for many years now. And in a letter released this week, the president of the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops said this means that, quote, all of us together need to continue in our common efforts to find new ways to su sustain and extend our presence and service in Northern Canada. Cardinal George Pell is scheduled to give testimony to Australia's Royal Commission into Institutional Responses into Child Sex Abuse next month. Now, he was supposed to fly back to Melbourne back in December to appear before this commission, but that was cancelled. He was forced to cancel that because he has a heart condition, and his cardiologist in Rome said he could not take a long-haul flight in this condition. Now, the judge conducting the inquiry refused to allow the Cardinal to testify via video link, and it has not been confirmed yet if Cardinal Pell will make it to Australia for February's hearing. A few weeks back, we told you about the Pan-Orthodox Synod scheduled for June of this year and the doubts surrounding it. We have now learned that the Synod will take place June 16th to 27th, and it will be held in Crete. It was supposed to be in Turkey, but after a Russian plane was downed over Turkey, the leaders of the Russian Orthodox Church refused to attend the Synod if it was held, held in Istanbul. Did you know? Choirs and orchestras can perform briefly at the Vatican during the general audience. The prefecture of the papal household takes requests and coordinates these performances.
Last week in a small community in northern Saskatchewan, a young man opened fire, killed his two brothers, and then went to the local high school and killed a teacher and an assistant there. The community of Lalash, Saskatchewan was plunged into a surreal situation and overcome with grief. Now, as you can imagine, government officials and media descended on the town promising resources and making bold public statements. But in the middle of this, the Archbishop responsible for Lalosh, Archbishop Murray Shetland of Kiwatan La Paz, made his own way to the town in haste and he stayed on hand after the politicians were gone and the media had filed their stories. Our Deacon Pedro Guevaraman spoke to Archbishop Shetland on the phone from La Loche this week for the Salt and Light Radio Hour. They talked about the community and a church's role in tragedies like this. Here's that conversation now. Archbishop Murray Chatlin, thank you for taking a little time to speak with us today. Now, I know you're currently in the town of La Loche in northern Saskatchewan as, as you're helping the community grieve. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, about the town of La Loche and, and I guess of the people that you serve in the Archdiocese of Kiwatan La Paz? I uh, was uh, able to take a sabbatical about 15 years ago to study the Dene language. And so the best place was to come to La Loche, they told me, because the language is still very strong here. The children still speak uh, their language. So I came up here 15 years ago and spent a year uh, uh, living and studying the language with the people. So I have a, a relationship and history here. So that's of great help. And then I've been their bishop for about three years coming mm -hmm. up now. And uh, so uh, it just is uh, uh, unfortunate that the pastor that we have here is gone for holidays back to India. So right. not something you can return to. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, I came here to be with the people during this time. And uh, it's, it's a gift to be able to try to offer some presence and support. Right. Is it mainly a Catholic community? Pretty well, like 95%. Really? So there's the one, one church in town, and it's a Catholic church? That's right. And Is uh, pretty well everyone prays the rosary uh, during all these tragic events, and uh, that's uh, the Dene hymns uh, right. are uh, French Catholic hymns that have been translated. So and, there's and a tradition. And just so that people can get a sense of distances, because you live in the Pa in northern Manitoba. How far is the Loche from where you live? It is uh, about 850 kilometers <laughs> away, uh, some of that gravel road. Right. So it's a fair drive. S so you drove? Yes. Wow. And that's the law drive. Is it uncommon for a community like that to have it, its own priest? Uh, well, usually they share, uh, and there, this priest also has a little community called Turner Lake as well. So we have priests pretty well always will be serving more than one community. Right. Now, the relationship I know that, that you have a because, uh, because of your experience, and of course you speak the language, um, the relationship that the church has with the elders in the community is a very healthy relationship, I presume. I hope so. Uh, like any family, we have our ups and downs, but yes. I think overall there's a, a healthy uh, history here. Right. Now, I know... I, I think we we know what the role of the church is in general, and I think most of us understand the role of the church in, in mission country, in mission diocese. Um, and I think we also understand the role of the church in situations like this of tragedy. Um, but maybe what we don't know is what those of us who are not there can do. So w is there something that you would like to tell Catholics in Canada in the wake of this tragedy? I, I think uh, obviously the first thing in which we're really appreciative is all the prayers that uh, fellow Catholics are offering to this very Catholic community. Uh, I think that uh, another piece is um, just the encouragement of our Aboriginal brothers and sisters, often who are struggling in difficult uh, situations, that uh, how we talk about them, how we um, uh, try to accompany and encourage is important. And uh, often... Uh, the people can feel, uh, uh, I guess, kind of uh, frustrated about their own uh, own situation. And if there's discouraging words from outside as well, it can uh, mm -hmm. compound the, uh, the despair. Right. So uh, just encourage people to have prayer.
prayers and an open mind to the goodness that's here as well as the challenges. Thank you very much, Your Grace. And please be assured that our prayers are with you and with the community of Lalash. Okay. Thank you, Deacon Pedro. Pope Benedict XVI on Saturday morning met privately with the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams. During the talks, the two men elaborated on the challenges faced by all Christian communities at the beginning of this millennium and the need to encourage forms of collaboration and common witness when addressing them. They also spoke about recent events which have affected relations between the Catholic Church and Anglican Communion and reaffirmed their common will to continue and strengthen ecumenical relations between Catholics and Anglicans. In the coming days, there will be a meeting to prepare for the third phase of the International Anglican Roman Catholic Theological Dialogue. Pope Francis had an interesting lineup of meetings this week. Let's take a look. First up, on Monday, Pope Francis celebrated an ecumenical Vespers service at the Basilica of St. Paul's outside the walls. The prayer service marked the end of the week of prayer for Christian unity. CNS has more. In questo anno giubilare e straordinario della misericordia, teniamo ben presente che non può esserci autentica ricerca dell'unità dei cristiani senza un pieno affidarsi alla misericordia del Padre. Chiediamo anzitutto perdono per il peccato delle nostre divisioni, che sono una ferita aperta nel corpo di Cristo. Come Vescovo di Roma e pastore della Chiesa Cattolica, voglio invocare misericordia e perdono per i comportamenti non evangelici tenuti da parte di cattolici nei confronti di cristiani di altre Chiese. Allo stesso tempo, invito tutti i fratelli e le sorelle cattolici a perdonare se oggi o in passato hanno subito, subito offese da altri cristiani. Non possiamo cancellare ciò che è stato, ma non vogliamo permettere che il peso delle colpe passate continui a inquinare i nostri rapporti. La misericordia di Dio rinnoverà nostre relazioni. On Tuesday, the Pope met with the President of Iran, Hassan Rouhani. This was the first time a Pope met an Iranian President since 1999. Now, according to the Vatican, they talked about the shared spiritual values that the Holy See and Iran have. As well, talk turned to the application of the nuclear accord that Iran signed with seven countries over the summer. They also talked about the important role Iran can play in helping find peaceful political solutions to the unrest in the region. Wednesday was the general audience. Now this week there was a special treat for the Pope and the faithful. A circus troupe performed at the end of the audience. Catholic News Service has more. La misericordia non può rimanere indifferente davanti alla sofferenza degli oppressi, al grido di chi è sopposto a violenza, ridotto in schiavitù, condannato a morte. Dio invece non è indifferente. Non distoglie mai lo sguardo dal dolore umano. 
Il Dio di misericordia risponde e si prende cura dei poveri, di coloro che gridano la loro disperazione. Dio ascolta e interviene per salvare, suscitando uomini capaci di sentire il gemito della sofferenza e di operare in favore degli oppressi. Chiediamo al Signore che quest'anno della misericordia anche noi facciamo cose di misericordia, apriamo il nostro cuore per arrivare a tutti con le opere di misericordia che è l'eredità misericordiosa che Dio Padre ha avuto con noi. On Thursday, Pope Francis met with the President of Togo. As usual, they talked about the good relations between Togo and the Holy See, as well as the Church's contributions to the development of that country. Then the conversation turned to the challenges that are faced in Western and Sub-Saharan Africa and the need for collaboration in order to secure peace and stability. Also on Thursday, after that meeting, Pope Francis met with the Italian Bioethics Committee. He said, science and biotechnology risk becoming concerned only with what is useful because of the fast pace of progress. He told the committee biotechnology must never be used in a way that's harmful to human dignity or with commercial goals. He encouraged committee members to reject a throwaway culture that treats the sick, the dying, the elderly, and human embryos as disposable material. In between those audiences, Pope Francis met with Hollywood actor Leonardo DiCaprio, who is a passionate environmentalist. The actor greeted the Pope in Italian, and the Pope replied in English. They talked privately for 15 minutes with the help of translators, and at the end of the private chat, DiCaprio introduced the Pope to his father. He also gave the Pope a book of works by the 15th century Dutch painter Hieronymus Bosch and showed the Pope the triptych that hung over his bed as a child. He also handed the Pope a donation to the Papal Charitable Fund. Now, the Pope, in return, gave DiCaprio a copy of Laudato Si and Evangelii Gaudium. Most people don't know that DiCaprio was actually raised Catholic. Now, it wasn't a big week for resignations and nominations, but there were a few things to talk about, so let's take a look. First up, in Guatemala, Pope Francis created a new diocese. It is called the Diocese of St. Francis of Assisi of Jutiapa. This new diocese is a suffragan of Santiago de Guatemala. Now, the first ever bishop for the diocese is Father Antonio Calderon Cruz. The new diocese has almost 400,000 Catholics. There is a new apostolic nuncio to Moldova. The Spanish Archbishop Miguel Mauri Buendia will represent the Pope in Moldova. He is also the nuncio to Romania. And although it's not a papal appointment, it is a change. A priest from the Archdiocese of Regina has been chosen to act as administrator until a new bishop can be named. Father Lauren Crozon was elected administrator. He had been serving as vicar general. Archbishop Daniel Bohan died of lung cancer on January 15th at the age of 74. Archbishop Bohan is survived by his mother, two sisters, and three brothers.
Well, that's all for this edition of Vatican Connections. Join us again next time for more. Until then, follow us on Twitter or Facebook or check our blog for updates. We are going to leave you now with more from the circus performance that happened at this week's general audience. From everyone here, thanks for watching. See you next time.